And now we uh, shift to Daniel Whitfrit, sorry. Uh, he's going to talk about the connectomes across development reveal principles of brain maturation in C. elegans. Uh, on to you, Daniel. Great, thank you so much. Um... Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so today I'll be talking about a project that I spearheaded while in, in May Zen's lab in the University of Toronto. So the question that, that we've been trying to answer is how brain wiring changes throughout life. And that's because during development, the nervous system faces multiple challenges. So new circuits need to be built to support new functions. Existing circuits need to be maintained despite uh, constantly changing anatomy. And to adapt and learn, circuits must be optimized to a fluctuating environment. And it's really poorly understood how neural circuits change across the brain to cope with these challenges, because that would require mapping the entire synaptic wiring diagrams across multiple life stages. And this is just currently not feasible to the vast number of cells in, in the brains of, of larger animals. Um, so to study the anatomy and function of all neurons throughout an entire brain, we have to turn to a much smaller animal, such as that of the nematode C. elegans, whose entire nervous system consists of only about 300 neurons. So even though their nervous system is small, uh, it's organized similar to the systems of larger animals, meaning that, that the worm has a brain where most sensory information converge, decision-making happens. It has a main nerve cord where much of locomotion is controlled, and it has periphery neurons throughout the body, most of which collect sensor information that's directed uh, back into the, the brain. And because of its small size, we can map the entire nervous system at synapse resolution, meaning that we can get a complete wiring diagram or connectome of the nervous system. And another advantage of the worm is its stereotypic cell lineage, meaning that the birth time and location of each cell is almost identical across animals. So we can directly compare every neuron and its connections between individuals to find out how the connectome changes from animal to animal. And finally, C. elegans populations are isogenic because they make clones of themselves. So we can pretty much eliminate genetic differences as being the cause of any connectivity differences we observe between animals. So altogether, this, this makes for an ideal system to extract fundamental principles about how and why brain wiring changes across life. We would simply have to reconstruct the connectome across all of these different life stages and then look and, and at the changes and, and analyze how, how they actually change. So to do this, uh, we developed a high throughput serial section electron microscopy pipeline, which allows us to reconstruct the entire brain of a nematode in a few months. And I'm not sure how well this video here works across Zoom, um, but what you're supposed to see is an electron microscopy volume that consists of about 5,000 images covering an entire C. elegans brain. And here we're just seeing the images at low resolution, but each frame here actually consists of more than 1,000 megapixels, uh, meaning that we have enough resolution to clearly see individual neurons and synapses. And getting a volume like this involves staining the animal with heavy metals to make the cells visible by electron microscopy, then cutting the animals into thousands of ultra-thin serial sections that are imaged one by one, and finally tracing all the neurons and, and annotating all their synapses throughout each of these sections. So here every neural process and then muscle fiber throughout the brain has been given a, a, a specific color. Um, so we focused on, on the brain as it contains the majority of neuron classes and it's where most decision-making happens. So each cell here is colored by its type, um, which we know based on its morphology and, and from previous studies. Um, and finally, of course, we have all the synapses between um, the different neurons, which should come up in just a second. Um, right, there's all the coordinates of the different uh, synapses. Um, so basically, we did this for eight isogenic animals across development, um, which you can see on, on this timeline here. And with these data sets, we can examine how the synaptic connectivity and morphology of each neuron change across maturation at the level of the entire brain. So with only about 12 minutes today, I've, I don't have any time to, to show you all of our findings. Um, so I encourage anyone interested to, to learn more to look at our preprint, which I'll, I'm putting here in the, the corner of the screen. Um, but I, I can show you what, what I think is our most interesting findings. So for any one of these data sets, we can plot their connectome um, as a network graph, where each circle here represents one cell and then each line represents all the synapses um, between 
cells, which we call, or we determine as a, we call a connection. So some connections um, consist of more synapses and are therefore stronger than um, other connections. And so we observed a five-fold increase in synapse number during maturation, which creates many new connections, uh, meaning that synapses are added between cells that were not already connected before. And the addition of synapses also strengthens existing connections, meaning that the number of synapses per connection increases. So we asked whether this large increase in new connections and the strengthening of existing connections happen uniformly throughout the brain. And first, to better understand the strengthening of different connections, uh, we look closer to individual cells. So we correlated the strength of all inputs to a cell, um, the, all the outputs uh, from the cell, cell, same cell, and connections between different cells. So I'm going to show you the result in, in this plot here, uh, where the y-axis, the coefficient of variation synapse number, um, simply means how different the synapse number is between two connections. So over time, unsurprisingly, if we look at connection to and from different cells, they diverged in, in synapse number. And the same was the case for inputs to a cell. But interestingly, the relative strength of outputs from a cell were maintained. Uh, this contrast between inputs and outputs is, is most clear if you just take the difference between the two, which is shown here in, in this plot. So the relative strength of outputs, but not inputs, are maintained across maturation. Or said in another way, each cell regulates the strengthening of its own synaptic outputs, but does not dictate the relative strengthening of its inputs. But uh, this analysis here, all the neurons are anonymous. And then, of course, one of the advantages of using C. elegans is that we actually have identities of each of these cells. So we can ask which specific connection to change across development. So to do this, we classified uh, connections by their stability across individuals and, and across development. So some connections are stable, meaning that we see them in every single animal. Some connections are developmentally dynamic, meaning that they show a significantly increase or decrease in synapse number in a stereotyped manner across maturation, sometimes even forming new connections or eliminating existing connections at specific life stages. And other connections are variable, meaning that they exhibit no consistent trend in their changing synapse number and they're not present in every animal. These variable connections are typically only present in one or two animal and not animals, typically not animals of the same ages. So these variable connections are surprisingly common. If you just count all the number of connections in the different stages, we see that variable connections make up about half of all connections in the adult connectome. And this degree of variability contrasts with the widely held view that the C. elegans connectome is, is hardwired. Um, in addition, this, these variable connections are not simply randomly distributed throughout the brain, uh, which we can see when we compare the number of variable versus non-variable connections for, for each cell type. So we find that variable connections are most common among modular neurons and least common among motor neurons. And the high stereotypy of synapses for motor neurons may reflect a requirement for high fidelity in circuits for motor execution. On the other hand, modular neurons may have the weakest requirement for the precise positioning of their synapses because they uh, often can exert long range effects by monoamines and, and neuropeptides. This non-uniform distribution suggests the variability in some way regulated and may be functionally important, for example, as a source of behavioral variability. Similar to analysis of, of variable connections, we examine the prevalence of, of developmentally dynamic connections, which are the, the ones to change across maturation. So we again group cells by their type. Uh, this time showed somewhat differently at an, as a network graph, where each arrow here indicates all the non-variable connections going from one cell type to that of another. Um, we found that developmentally dynamic connections are distributed throughout all layers of the network, but most changes are seen at the periphery of the connectome between sensor neurons, motor neurons, and motor neurons. And in contrast, the communication within the interneuron layer that may constitute the core decision-making architecture of the brain is remarkably stable. The stability of, of the core parts of the nervous system across maturation implies that the central processing unit is robust enough to be used in different contexts. So maturation changes the flow of sensor information into the central processor and changes its readout without changing the actual central processor itself. So we've observed patterns of synaptic chains that are evident at a level of neuron types, but we also wanted to ask if the collective set of synaptic changes leads to changes in information processing at the level of the entire brain. 
So we looked at that in, in two different ways. Uh, first, we examined the community structure of the brain. So we used an algorithm called uh, weighted stochastic block modeling, which group neurons of similar connectivity into distinct modules. And we found that the connectome becomes more modular across maturation, increasing from two to six modules. Um, subcellular networks for sensor and motor processing gradually emerge um, throughout development. Another global pattern of brain maturation was evident when we examined the directionality of information flow. So we classified connections from the sensory to motor layer as feed forward and connections in the opposite direction as feedback. And interestingly, we found that across maturation, the connectome becomes increasingly more feed forward biased. Um, so another global pattern of brain maturation increases signal flow from sensation to action, making the brain more reflexive and less reflexive with age. And both of these measurements indicate that brain-wide computation is becoming more specialized across maturation, uh, possibly as an adaptation to the animal's environment. So to sum up, um, we've uncovered principles of synaptic remodeling at multiple levels of the connectome. At one level that, that applies to individual neurons in the brain, we've observed patterns of synaptic remodeling that alter the number and strength of individual neurons. And I didn't have time to talk about all of these principles today, um, just, just the last one, but if you're interested to see, talk here about the other ones and to have a look at our preprint. Um, and at a second level, we observed synaptic remodeling that differed between cell types. And at a third level, we've observed network changes that alter the directionality of information flow and the segregation of information processing throughout the brain. So finally, I have to thank uh, everyone involved in this project because it's, it's taken a while and, and there's been a lot of people doing different things, but especially uh, my old lab, in Toronto and, and the Samuel Lishman lab at Harvard and the Shivit lab at, at MIT. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, it was really a very interesting talk and I was quite impressed by seeing those networks between the neurons. We have some questions for you. Uh, Na Yuan is asking, can you clarify how the developmentally dynamic connections were identified compared to variable connections? Right. So. Um, so developmentally dynamic connections are the ones that show a statistically significant increase in synapse number from birth to adulthood, if we consider all the different stages, or a statistically significant decrease in synapse number from, from birth to adulthood. And um, the most of these cases of developmentally dynamic connections are actually things that don't exist early on and then they gradually appear or they exist early on and then they gradually disappear. But there are also cases where you have connections that are fairly weak to begin with and then they get extremely strong because they have many, many synapses and they come out as statistically significant. Um, and then the variable connections are basically the ones that don't show such a trend. So they don't appear in every animal, but they don't have a clear developmental trend. So they often just appear in one animal or two animal somewhat sporadically. Um, and with our only eight data sets, we can't exclude that some of these variable connections might have some developmental trends if we had more animals or um, uh, more animals even at, this, at the same developmental stage. But yeah, that's, that's basically the difference. Uh, thanks, Daniel. There's one more question, and I guess we can cover it up within a minute, if possible. Uh, so basically, Fernando wants to ask that these are really cool images and presentation, but how can you have more input connections without more output connections? More input connections without output connections. Um, let me maybe go back to that slide. I think it's referring to the first thing I talked about, um, this thing. Right, so um, here we're not talking about necessarily um, more outputs and more inputs, but we're talking about the difference between outputs and inputs. So this is, here we're just seeing the difference in input. So you're basically taking, if you look at this uh, motif here, you're correlating the number of synapses in the in one connection with the number of synapses in the other connections. So one is changing over time. These ones are changing over time. One grows more than necessarily the other one here. One grows more than the other one, but for the outputs, they grow similarly. Um, so it, it's not necessarily that you're getting more outputs, it's just the outputs are, are growing at a similar rate compared to the, the inputs. 
Thank you so much. There were a few more questions and I'm sure